Hello! The goal of Project Awesome is to build a fully functional yet mobile pipe organ. Now pipe organs have been around for a long long time and before they look like this, or some of them look like this, the main place you'd find a pipe organ would be in a church and those two were designed to be awesome. Imagine for a moment being one of the medieval common folk on a rare day off from toiling in the fields on a holiday, a holy day, and you get to go into a church or better yet a cathedral. Imagine how overwhelming the sheer scale of the place would be. You've hardly ever seen a building bigger than the one-room hovel that you call home, that you were born in and still live in with your family and farm animals. But this place, it goes on forever, leaping stone arches, buttresses reaching into the sky, glorious decoration on every dressed stone and polished wood surface. And then, just as if all that wasn't overwhelming enough, the organ starts to play music but not music like you're familiar with, not like somebody on the fiddle down at the local tavern. This music fills everything so loud that you can feel it more than you can hear it. You would have been quite literally filled with awe. And that was the whole point of course, everything about the place, the grandeur, the noise, the entire building was all designed to inspire awe within the congregation, to remind them both of the glory of heaven and the utter insignificance of their own lives. Now, nowadays, neither the church nor its buildings have the effect they once had, but the church organ itself still stands as amongst the most powerful acoustic instrument ever made. So the mighty church organ then becomes the starting point of our own organ project. But, not wanting to restrict ourselves to one type of sound, we are doing something that will provoke instant damnation in the eyes of any organ purist. We are mixing the church organ with a much younger but equally potent machine, the cinema organ. Now, just as it's hard to imagine the impact of church going for a peasant of the Middle Ages, I think it's hard nowadays with screens around us everywhere and all the time to imagine the impact of early cinema. But I think once again the effect would have been awe-inspiring. Now those early films were silent in the sense that they had no built-in soundtrack, no dialogue. But they were not viewed in silence, they were accompanied by live music. Now in a small theatre that would just be a chap on a piano. But as the medium became more popular and the venues and the crowds grew, a whole orchestra was employed to provide a score for the film. Trouble is, it gets very expensive to employ an entire orchestra, especially if you're running multiple showings per day. Not only that, but with the films changing every week or so, they were constantly rehearsing new material as well. It didn't take long before somebody realised that if it was somehow possible to build a single instrument to take the place of a whole orchestra's worth of instruments, even if that single instrument was both complex and expensive, it would very soon pay for itself. That someone was a very clever man called Robert Hope Jones, and it's thanks mainly to his work that the cinema or theatre organ was born. Now, here in the UK, it was a cinema organ. It's a theatre organ in the USA, as in movie theatres. But I think it's appropriate to use both names because Hope Jones himself came up with the concept here in the UK, but developed it in the USA when he worked for the soon to be very famous Wurlitzer Company. Hope Jones's major innovation was to develop the electro pneumatic action. So the old church organs had each key of the keyboard physically connected to the note that it plays. So one of the reasons church, church music is slow and ponderous is not just to install awe, but it's an actual limitation of the speed of the machinery. But now each key is an electric contact switch and as electricity moves almost instantly, the new organs are much snappier and can be played just as fast as the organist's fingers could move. Or in the case of our organ, even faster, but we'll, we'll get to that. As you can see, we've popped out to the workshop, and the reason is, rather than describe to you electro pneumatic action, which is all a bit abstract, I thought I'll just show you. So these are the first two Winchests that we built for the organ. This is the very first Winchest that we built, and this one doesn't even have electro pneumatic action. This one is pure electric. So I'm going to show you how that works, because it's very crude and simple, and then we'll compare it to this one, which has got the electro pneumatic action. And as we go through this, I figured for the 90-odd percent of you that aren't familiar with pipe organs, you'll get a good feeling for how the thing operates. So we've got air comes in through this tube here into the wind chest. Now, as the name implies, it's a chest, that is a wooden box, full of wind. 
and then the wind has to be dispensed into the pipes. So we've got all these little pipes across the top. Each pipe is just one note. Unlike say a um, recorder or flute or <laughs> any other kind of instrument like that. So just one pipe per note. And then what activates the pipe, what lets the air get from the wind chest into the pipe is the action. So inside this chest is a whole rank of solenoids, which are these things. So if I attach a battery to it, it does that. Looking at the back of the wind chest now, and you can see that every solenoid that goes with every pipe has got its own bit of wiring here, and they all come to a head here, and obviously when all this is installed, it comes down these control cables. But we can shortcut it again. And I can activate any one of them individually. And so you can imagine with the cover on here and with this full of wind inside, that action there will let some of the air out, up through the pipe, play a note. So now you know about pure electric action. And it works, but its main drawback is it's, it's slow. It's a slow mechanism still. And it's slow because this has got a there's a lot of movement that has to happen here. And that's all done away with, with the electro pneumatic action, which we have on this wind chest. What we have here on the back of this wind chest is a whole row of electromagnets. And the difference between these ones and the direct action magnets in the other wind chest is that these have a tiny range of motion and hence a very fast action. So if I open up one of these, inside we've got this tiny little valve. And that's it, that's all the motion that this one has compared to that. So you can imagine this action then can occur much, much quicker. That's only half the mechanism, of course, because unlike this one, which has to do all the operation on its own, the electro here operates the pneumatic, which is this part. So this little bellows sits with this felt pad pushed up against the inside of the box. When this is activated, this bellows collapses, pulling the felt pad down and letting the air flow through up the pipe again. I've undone all the screws for this and get the pipes off. So you can see all the wiring coming to all the electromagnets. And then if I flip the top over here, you'll see the inside. Inside the wood is a channel that's cut in here underneath these bits of paper that joins that valve in the electromagnet to the bellows. So that when you press a key on the keyboard, it exhausts the air out of here, moves this and plays a note. I hope that made sense. Let's get back into the warm. So it soon discovered this much faster action could be used for more than just activating pipes and soon the organist was accompanying the film with a whole suite of extra sound effects from car horns to sleigh bells to pounding drums. So just like the church organs before them, the cinema organ grew into a mighty beast of a machine that was built into the very fabric of the building. Despite all this investment and development, the heyday of the cinema organ in its original function was very brief. As we all know, the silent film soon gave way to the talkies. But by this point, the sound of the organ had become a musical genre in its own right. The 1920s and 30s were the golden age of radio, and soon every household in the country had a wireless set. And believe it or not, organ music and the organists that played it became incredibly popular. The author of this book here was a chap called Reginald Ford the country's number one recording artist of his day. And that's him there, what a dapper fellow. He actually has a direct influence on our project because he's one of the few people I've ever come across that made a kind of mobile pipe organ, except the one that he made was <laughs> dismantled, packed into lorries and then rebuilt at another uh, venue. That's the road train of all the trucks that took, I don't know if you can make out the name there, Reginald Fort and his gigantic organ. <laughs> Reginald Fort shared the limelight with another Reginald, Reginald Dixon, 
And between the two of them, they were incredibly well known, but known for their voices, for doing radio shows, and of course for their music. He relates in here that uh, he could travel around, around the country by train completely anonymously, but if he actually said anything, people would recognize him and he'd be immediately mobbed by fans. Now, eventually, musical taste moved on. As with most musical genres, a dedicated fan base remained, but as cinemas became modernized or turned into bingo halls, the organ faded from prominence. It's never died out completely, but the fan base shrunk simply due to people dying of old age. I've got a live album down here, recorded in the 80s. A chap called Robert Wolf. There he is there, a signed copy this is. But you can see his audience here. Most of them have got white hair, and this is back in the 80s. So I think even the children of the people in this audience will be getting on a bit now. Robert Wolf himself is still, still alive and still going strong. Fair play to him. He was very young at the making of this album. So both the church and cinema organs were enormous and enormously complicated machines. Part of the very architecture of the buildings that housed them. The church organ primarily to produce slow, powerful music to accompany the singing of hymns. The cinema organ capable of much wider range of sounds. But I think the signature sound of the cinema organ is the heavy use of the tremulant. The tremulant is simply a device that shakes the air on its way into the wind chest. Uh, which gives a sort of vibrato effect that's incredibly cheesy to the modern ear, but I think would have been amazingly progressive when first heard. Our organ is a mixture of the two styles, something that will horrify any organ purists out there, but you can't do anything without upsetting some folk. Not only that, it will have many electronic elements to it, even more horrifying. Now there have been a few hybrid organs before, both hybrid in the sense of church and cinema and hybrid in the sense of acoustic and electronic. And ours will be both, both types of hybrid and it'll be fully mobile, it'll live on the back of a truck. I think that's fairly unique, but if you, if you know of any others, do let me know. Now, when I mention it being mobile, many of you will immediately think of fairground organs, and that's one thing that ours is definitely not. There is a fundamental difference between church and cinema organs on the one hand, and fairground organs on the other, and that's the range of these range of sounds that they can produce. Both church and cinema organs are fully chromatic. In other words, they can play all the notes, all the notes that we have in the European musical tradition, that is. A fairground organ, this isn't a fairground organ by the way, this is a fake, this is a facade, probably from a fairground ride. But a fairground organ can't play all the notes, it just, they don't have room for all the pipes, for one thing. You can't have big bass pipes in there, you can't have lots and lots of pipes. So any music that's played on a fairground organ has to be adapted to play on it. Another big limitation of fairground organs, because they're players rather than instruments, you may have seen that they, have, they, they run off punch card, or they used to. And of course, on a punch card, so it's a, it's a roll of paper with holes in it, and those holes go over valves which blow air through channels. <laughs> None of this matters too much, but just get the point that there's only so much information you can fit on that paper roll. So only so many notes that you can play. So anything you hear on a fairground organ has been adapted for that instrument. What we're trying to build is a fully chromatic organ. So something that's much more in the style of the church organ or cinema organ. We could have made our project much easier by building something like a fairground organ, but we didn't. We haven't, and we're not going to. We aim to build an organ that anyone can sit in front of, plug in a keyboard and play whatever they want and it'll sound exactly as intended. Mm. Right, that's it for now. You're up to speed on pipe organ history in general. In the next instalment, we'll recap the story of our particular instrument. So I'll see you for that. Cheers for now.